Hey everybody, it's time for another edition of What You're Reading, where uh, people ask me all the time as a professional comic book writing writer of some standing, they ask me, what, what, what are you reading? I mean, you're writing all the time, but what are you reading when you're not writing? Well, um, that's what this show is about. <laughs> so recently, I, I just flashed through like a extra large tub of buttered popcorn um, this book by Quentin Tarantino called Cinema Speculation. And um, you all know Quentin Tarantino, iconoclastic, idiosyncratic, sometimes abrasive, always opinionated uh, screenwriter and film director, and sometimes, unfortunately, actor. But, <laughs> and love him or hate him, uh, you got to recognize that Quentin is one of the last truly independent filmmakers out there, a guy who uh, stands by his product, uh, won't back down, doesn't take no for an answer, uh, super self-indulgent, certainly, uh, but he's undeniably a force in Hollywood. And uh, he loves movies. And he's got, you know, quite the track record. You know, from Jackie Brown, to Kill Bill, Glorious Bastards, and uh, what I think is crowning achievement, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which um, is something I never thought I'd ever see Quentin Tarantino make, uh, something approaching a serious movie. And that's not putting him down. He's a genre guy. He likes lowbrow trashy kind of movies and so do i <laughs> so there's nothing wrong with that but once upon a time in hollywood uh until its final moments is is his attempt i think to make a serious film whether he meant to or not <laughs> oh, and uh got all kinds of uh attention which it deserved and generally i like uh i like and enjoy all of his movies with the exception of hateful eight which i dearly wish i could unsee um, but, but what this book is, it's, it's really unusual. It, it, it's, it's essays about film, it's criticism, it's, uh, an examination of the film process. It's, it's reviews of certain films with, along with cinema history and also part autobiographical as Quentin basically explains who he is and why he got to where he got to and his love of movies, particularly well, any kind of movie. So I was quite surprised by some of the movies he, he did. He does like. Uh, they're not all of the same uh, milieu, the same genres. Uh, but, you know, he was a, a grindhouse guy. And uh, he's he, and he talks about that. He's, uh, it, a, a lot of the book is a kind of film journal, a history of him as a film goer. And um, he went to see a lot of the same movies I did, although he's he's like nine or ten years younger than me. Uh, and I don't really seriously wonder about his mom taking him to see some of the movies she took him to see. And uh, he describes in detail uh, his reactions as like a nine-year-old uh, to movies like Carnal Knowledge. Uh, my parents wouldn't have taken me uh, to see that, um, and I was old enough. Uh, so... <laughs> Um, so there's a lot of explanation of, you know, who he is. And I, I related to a lot of that because, you know, I was a grindhouse guy. My particular uh, favorite grindhouse was the Eric Terminal, 69th Street in Upper Darby, right on the edge of West Philadelphia. And they would show, uh, as you can see here, continuous performances daily. You got there at 11 in the morning and they showed movie upon movie, usually a triple bill, Charles Bronson, Kung Fu movies, black exploitation movies, whatever. And theater was unusual because it's the only theater I've ever been in where the lights never came on. They just kept running movies. And that's why they call it a grindhouse, because the movies just keep on running. So Quentin Tarantino talks a lot in the book about the different genres, Kung Fu movies, in particular black exploitation movies, which were a real revelation to him. And uh, he liked not only the movies, but the audience that went to see the movies. And this is really what sparked him to want to become a filmmaker and inspired him with each film he made. Uh, he, he says in the book that when he went to see the movie uh, Black Gun, a Jim Brown black exploitation movie, the audience's reaction was so visceral. The excitement, the frisson of energy in the audience was so big 
that he said he thinks about that whenever he makes movies now that he would he his goal is to get an audience to react in that same way to his own film product uh, in addition to being autobiographical he goes into a lot of detail uh, and his own opinions and sort of a psychoanalysis of some filmmakers. Um, and he does this, you know, not just by speculation, as the title might suggest, but by, you know, multiple interviews and personal relationships and friendships with many of these filmmakers, uh, people like Walter Hill and others uh, who shared stories of working, um, you know, on genre films in particular. And so um, what we, his examination of Brian De Palma in particular is interesting because he said, the, he said and I mentioned this in a video earlier in the week, uh, that De Palma wanted to be, become a, a serious filmmaker. Uh, he wanted to be an A-list Hollywood director, uh, but he knew he couldn't, you just don't break in like that. So he picked a genre to break in on, and the genre he picked it was the Hitchcockian thriller. And while he liked this genre, he didn't love this genre, but he saw it as an opportunity because uh, Roman Polanski, following the Manson family murders, uh, sort of dropped out of the filmmaking business. And Polanski was always seen as the natural heir to the Hitchcock throne. And so the Palma saw a, a void there, a vacuum that he could fill and began making uh, Hitchcockian type thrillers. Uh, which were well-crafted, and that gained him his reputation as a big-time Hollywood director. Uh, but he didn't choose the genre. And Tarantino goes on to say that the filmmakers that followed in his wake, uh, people like John Carpenter and George Lucas and John Milius, um, these were people who loved genre movies. And so uh, they wanted to make those kind of movies. They weren't simply an opportunity to be A-list directors, they were an opportunity to make the kind of movies they really liked. And uh, it's a neat little revelation. He goes in a bit about Hitchcock, talks about Hitchcock as seen through the eyes of different directors. And what was particularly edifying for me was his absolute loathing of the movie <laughs> Bride War The Bride War Black, which was Francois Truffaut's stated homage to Hitchcock that is the most un-Hitchcockian movie you would ever want to see. How a major filmmaker could say they were a student of Alfred Hitchcock's work and get everything wrong when they went to do a Hitchcock pastiche, it, it's beyond me. It's beyond Tarantino as well. There's not a memorable scene in this movie. There, there are no thriller suspense set pieces in this entire movie. And how you could say you made a Hitchcock film without one of them is beyond me because... Long after we forget the plots of Hitchcock films, they all had plots, but the plot was never important to Hitchcock. Uh, long after you forget the storyline, you remember Cary Grant hanging off the, you know, uh, Mount Rushmore. Uh, you know, you remember the shower scene in Psycho. I mean, uh, and that was Hitch's plan. You were to, you remember those those set piece suspense things were indelible. They were set in your mind forever. They were unforgettable. And so it made you come back again and again to a Hitchcock film to replicate those kind of thrills. He goes into the history and background of the movie The Getaway, and he had a lot of insider information because of Walter Hill's uh, talking to Walter Hill. And you learn a lot about the uh, production of this movie uh, based on a Jim Thompson movie, why uh, Jim Thompson novel, why it wasn't exactly like the Thompson novel, why the studio insisted on changes, uh, casting, casting always fascinates me. Jack Palance was going to have the Rudy role in this film, uh, but didn't get it. Jack Nicholson was briefly considered for the same role. Uh, would have been quite a different movie with those two. And, uh, but it was always going to be a Steve McQueen movie. And he goes into a bit about, uh, a lot about McQueen and his appeal and who he was and what made him such a big movie star. Uh, he examines a movie called The Outfit, and he agrees with me that this is the best adaptation of a Richard Stark novel ever made. Richard Stark novels, his character Parker, famously being played by Lee Marvin, Jason Statham, uh, Mel Gibson. Uh, but The Outfit is the closest, not only to the plot of the book, but to the feel of the Richard Stark Parker novels. And he goes into a long appreciation 
of Richard Stark, which of course I dug because I really like Richard Stark too. Uh, I, I discovered Stark a little earlier than Tarantino did. Um, but, you know, we were reading the same paperbacks around the same time, which is uh, kind of cool. Um, he goes into an examination of John Flynn's Rolling Thunder, which is a really it is still a shocking uh, action uh, exploitation film starring William Devane as a Vietnam vet uh, prisoner of war uh, who's sort of an empty shell, a sort of broken man when he comes home to the United States. Uh, and he has real no, really no purpose until his family is attacked and he has to uh, seek revenge. Uh, also stars Tommy Lee Jones and James Best, uh, who you may remember as the goofy sheriff on Dukes of Hazard, as a seriously creepy bad guy. Uh, if, if you've never seen Rolling Thunder, you really need to check it out. Uh, boy, this movie was hard to find uh, in the 70s. I, I had to catch up with it years after its release because uh, a lot of theaters wouldn't show it. And I think the uh, studio that originally released it was pretty much embarrassed by it and uh, kind of quashed its uh, release, although uh, it was always enormously popular with whatever audience I saw it with. He also goes into depth on Paradise Alley. And I mean, these, are, these are a lot of sleeper movies maybe you've never heard of, never seen, or heard of and have never seen. In Paradise Alley, Stallone, uh, writing and directing, and uh, a film set post-World War II. And Tarantino puts forward the theory that it's uh, Stallone's version of an East Side Kids movie. Basically, it's his version of a Hunts Hall, Leo Gorsi uh, Poverty Row movie. And it's hard to argue. He makes his case very well. But he goes into the history of it. Uh, it was once planned as an ABC TV movie before it got made into a feature film. Uh, but Stallone turned the deal down because they, they wanted to do some rewriting. Um, also, he goes into the lawsuit where um, Stallone was sued by the uh, people who distributed Rocky because they felt that um, he basically stole from himself to do Paradise Alley, even though he wrote Paradise Alley before he wrote Rocky. Uh, but what's really surprising in this chapter examining Paradise Alley is how he huge a fan of Stallone Quentin Tarantino is. It's something I could never have imagined. I didn't, I never really thought about it, but um, if I were to think of who are Tarantino's idols or who are people that he really respects in the business, I wouldn't have put Stallone on the list I, I, uh, because Stallone makes kind of um, a lot of feel-good movies, a lot of movies like Tarantino doesn't make. But Tarantino is not a, um, he's not blind to audiences uh, wants and what they want. Um, he likes a kind of lowbrow film that a large section of the audience doesn't like. Um, but he re recognizes that. He recognizes that is not, his, his tastes are not the mass appeal tastes of the general film audience. And he respects that. He doesn't put people down saying, you know, they should like my movies or they should like, you know, I spit on your grave because of this, this and that. And they just don't like it because they're stupid. No, he, he realizes they don't like this kind of movies because they're downers. You know, they don't want to go to the movies and feel bad. Uh, some of us do. Some of us like to touch that nerve, my, myself included. Uh, but he goes into a whole thing about Stallone's appeal, not only as an actor and a movie star, but as a writer and director, particularly as a writer. And he looks at a lot of films Stallone was in and identifies the scenes that Stallone rewrote, which is a game I play as well, uh, having met Sly and talked to him and actually talk story and talk plot line with him, uh, I came to realize a lot of the movies I saw him in uh, had scenes rewritten by Stallone himself. And Tarantino plays that game, which, which, which I play myself. I can, I can pretty readily examine what scenes in a Stallone movie were rewritten by Sly himself. So kind of fun. Um, I recommend the book highly if you, if you like movies, uh, if you, if you, if you're a, I'm just a big nerd about anything cinema. Uh, this book, this book's a treat. I mean, you, you can't put it down. Uh, like I said, it's like a big old tub of salted popcorn. You just want to get to the bottom. And um, and he's he's very candid. There's a lot of actually really touching stuff in the book. You learn a lot more about the guy, and like the guy a lot more because I know he can be abrasive. I know he can be opinionated. I know he can be like hyperkinetically nerdy uh, to almost being off-putting. 
but you got to admire um, the guy's earnestness and his love of what he does and his respect for the audience, uh, which is um, always admirable. Hey, a book that's still available on Amazon that, that Quentin Tarantino might actually like is my shoplifting novel, Shrinkage, set in Philadelphia in the 1970s. Uh, it's my homage to the old gold medal paperbacks of the 50s and 60s. You can find it. Uh, I, you can find it on Kindle, and you can find it in paperback as well at Amazon.com. I'll try to provide the link below. And I still got that Conan novel out. People are liking it. It's still selling briskly. You can go to Arkhaven, uh, get the paperback and a free ebook to go along with it, or just go over to Amazon, and your friendly Amazon driver will drop it off at your doorstep tomorrow so you can start reading The Siege of the Black Citadel. Uh, my second and third Conan novels are completed. The second one should be in release soon. It is called Caravan of the Damned. And uh, that's about it for me. I'll be back next week and tell you what, uh, what I read this week. How about that? See you down the road.